Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the latest edition of the Ivory Road podcast with myself, Dermot Kavanagh. Today, I am joined by Shimon Gergé Chassar, who is a political advisor for the European Green Party. He's a member of the Hungarian Green Party since 2015. And in his role with the European Greens, he focuses on Eastern European member states of the European Union. Shimon, how do you do? All good? I'm great, and thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. I'm really happy to be here. It's our pleasure. So today, as I'm sure everyone has, has figured out by now, we're going to talk about Hungary, because I think generally across the EU, we hear a lot about Viktor Orban without hearing too much about what actually goes on nationally in Hungary, how the Hungarian people feel about Orban and his leadership and his behavior in the European Parliament. So we're hoping to get to the bottom of some of these, these questions today. Okay, we're going to dive right in then, Shimon. So tell me, how do Hungarians feel about Viktor Orban being the prime minister and the leader of the country? Okay, um, before we start, I just want to make a small disclaimer in the beginning that um, the opinions that I express here are not that of the European Green Party or necessarily that of the Hungarian Greens, but are my own opinions. And I, I also wanted to give a, a shout out to um, a very good book that I think that if, if you want to learn more about uh, the situation in Hungary and, and especially the developments in the last 10 years, I very much advise you to read, which is by a Hungarian political economist. His name is Gabo Schering, and the title of the book is The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, Authoritarian Capitalism and the Accumulation, uh, the Accumulative State in Hungary. So if you're more interested into, into going into about 200 pages into that, um, do give it a read. So, well, it is really, I, I would say that in the last 10 years since Orban came to power for the second time, um, the Hungarian uh, electorate became very divided among the lines of how they approach the hegemonic party in power. Um, and it, this especially affected the, the political parties and, and uh, the political system of Hungary. So by 2018, 2019 especially, the main dividing line became whether you are in, in favor of uh, Fidesz Kade and Peso Orban's party plus the Christian Democrats continuing their coalition government or whether you want to remove them. Um, and then there are different answers. What would happen to Hungary once they are removed from power? Um, but this created a, a dynamic in which the opposition parties came closer together. So there was a very fragmented opposition um, beginning from 2010 in Hungary. In the early, sta early stages of uh, his governance, uh, Orban declared that his system, uh, the so-called central force field, is what operates in Hungary. And the, practically what this means is there is a hegemonic big party in the middle, which is Fidesz and KDMP. There is a party to the right, which would be then Jobbik in the beginning of the 2010s, um, which back then was a far right EU critical party. Mm -hmm. And then to the left of it is the rest of the opposition. So the socialist party, um, the the other socialist party, the former prime minister's party, plus the Greens. And the dynamics of the system was that because there are opposition to the main party from both sides, they can aim for the largest electorate, which is the center mm -hmm. and uh, the centrist voters. Now, the interesting dynamics in, in the recent years has been that this changed um, because Fidesz's narrative moved towards more to the, toward the right and more towards the Eurocritical kind of uh, far right narratives. Um, and there was also another idea that was voiced, which is that between the wall on the right and between Fidesz, there can be no parties. Okay. So the entire right spectrum uh, should be dominated by them, which also meant that the opposition parties somehow came together in an alliance. So this by now, by 2021, created this kind of uh, system you know, which is going towards what could appear to be a two-party system. So you have the opposition, six parties on the opposition on the one hand, mm 
and then Fidesz KD and beyond the other. And the 2022 election will be the, the testing grounds of how this works out. Absolutely. Perfect. Thanks for, thanks for clearing that up. It's, it's, um, it's a good overview to, to kick things off. So it's interesting you say they've essentially, in a un, unintentionally, he has united the, the left, essentially, you're saying, the opposition at least. Does this opposition and the people in, in Hungary in general as well, do they view him as a legitimate leader? Or do they view him more as an authoritarian leader, given that he has taken many steps that are they're pretty well in line with what authoritarians do? I think that really depends on, on who you ask. I would say that the majority of both the Hungarian citizens, and I, of course, cannot speak in the name of all of them, um, and the majority of the opposition parties do regard him as, as a legitimate leader, and that is because um, his party coalition won three consecutive elections with a two-thirds majority. Now, it, it's important to note here that maybe it's not so much uh, worthy to go into details, but there are certain laws in Hungary that can only be changed with a two-thirds majority. So, for example, the constitution can be changed by, by a two-thirds majority. Uh, the electoral law can be changed by a two-thirds majority. And I think why some voices do say that his system was kind of a coup on the existing Hungarian political system is because beginning in 2011, they have done those changes. They have changed the constitution, then they changed the electoral law, they changed the labor code, uh, they changed the civic code, they changed the media law. So practically the entire Hungarian legal system was redefined um, to their own flavor. So it's also important to note here that most of these laws were not voted on by the opposition, but the opposition was not needed to reach the two-thirds majority necessary to amend these laws. And therefore, there are some, I would say, niche voices that claim that his system is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that for the opposition to claim that would say that this arena in which they operate is illegitimate, which of course they do not want to claim because then what is their justification for running at elections? Um, and I think that you could go in, in more, you know, a theoretical debate about what is the extent of democracy? Is it the institutions or is it um, the content that those institutions are filled with? Uh, I, I just want to note here that uh, the Varieties of Democracy Institute Democracy Report for 2020 classified Hungary as an electoral authoritarian regime and uh, Freedom House's annual report, Freedom in the World, has classified Hungary, I think, beginning in 2015 as a partially free state. Now, those indicators are, of course, based on their own um, estimates. Um, and there is definitely certain truth to the, to the extent that um, the governing parties instru instrumentalized the state itself and the resources of the state for their own benefits. But one could also argue, and the governing parties do argue, that they still operate within both a free market economy and both within the framework of a democracy. And I think that is the core issue why it is very hard to, to tackle, um, both from a European angle and both from, from a national angle. Uh, the question of Hungarian democracy, because the framework is there. And in paper, there is a chance for the opposition to win. Uh, there is a chance for the, the governing party to be removed. Um, interestingly, with the change of the electoral law, if there would be a majority on the side of the opposition, they would win with a bigger margin inside the parliament uh, mm -hmm. than before. And this was kind of the whole idea behind this uh, central force field that I mentioned before, that it was always Fidesz that is going to win the majority and therefore their majority in the parliament would be always increased. Now, since this changed, there is now an interesting situation that if the opposition manages to, to gather a majority behind themselves, they could also have a large majority in parliament come 2022. But this remains to be seen. 
And there are also deficiencies within the state which um, make the playing ground for them rather difficult. To say a few examples, the mo most of the official institutions are led by people who were appointed by either the Fidesz majority or who were themselves members of the governing party at certain points in the history, such as um, the leader of the National Judiciary Office, which oversees the judiciary, the public prosecutor, who starts all the lawsuits based on corruption cases, for example, in the country, um, the head of the Electoral Commission, um, which commission decides on referendums, on where elections will be held, on whether they accept um, the candidacies of certain candidates, um, the National Audition Office, which practically oversees the finances of uh, state, institution, state institutions and parties. So there are very high strategic officials which were put in place by, by the governing parties and which make it harder for, for independent voices or the opposition to operate. Okay, that's, that's perfect. You mentioned that the, at the start of that last, um, that last point, that there's been a, a pretty much a, an entire overhaul of the, the legal systems um, changing with sweeping changes across the board. Did Fidesz get elected promising changes like this? Or were these either changes that they had planned but they didn't make public? Or were these, how much of these changes boil down to Orban himself? And how much of the change lies at the, at the feet of Fidesz, the, the party? Well, I think it would be really hard to separate Orban from Fidesz. Mm -hmm. um, he has been the president of Fidesz since, I believe, 1993. And there was only one occasion between 2002 and 2003 when he was not the president of the party. And he's been a member of parliament since 1990, like continuously. So for the last 30 years, his name was the same as, as Fidesz itself. What is also important to note here, and I think that there was a lot of recent attention to Hungary, but, but this might not be a known fact, that Fidesz started out as a liberal party in the 1990s, and Orban himself was the vice president of the International Liberal Alliance uh, up until 2000. So the party gradually changed from, from being um, what would be aligned today with the Liberal Democrats in the UK or um, with maybe uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, Unmarsh movement to closer to the CDU in Germany to being now, well, the far right tendencies party that it is today. Um, how much was it an electoral promise? The main idea of their governance has been since 2010 that Hungary is operating in a majoritarian democracy, which means that in their own understanding that they have been given ultimate power by the people because they have been granted two thirds majority in parliament thrice. Mm -hmm. And that means that they do not need to listen to opposition voices. They do not need to consult or make compromises with with the opposition or with the civil society or with trade unions or any kind of representative bodies, but they can execute their own bill. Uh, it's also important to note that since 2010, they have not published an electoral manifesto. So in 2014 and 2018, they have been elected by just saying that we will continue governing as we have been. Um, and for, for this whole change of the legal system, their narrative is that because before them, the governing parties were the Socialist Party and the Liberal Party. And the Socialist Party is a legal continuation of the Communist Party of Hungary that was ruling under um, Soviet leadership until, until 1990. So their narrative is that there was a revolution, an electoral democratic revolution in 2010, which sweeped out the remnants of the communists from power. And 
the legacy of this communist past was both the constitution because it was based on a constitution adopted, I think in 1945. And the electoral law was also a kind of compromise that was reached at the end of the communist era. So in their understanding, they started Tabula Raza. Mm -hmm. They had a, a revolution in, in the polls and they created a completely new legal system which fits um, the traditional Hungarian understanding of constitutionality. Uh, now, of course, because it was adopted by two parties, but practically a single party for all intents and purposes, the Christian Democrats don't exist, um, which will be an interesting topic if you go into the European People's Party. I will talk about it. Oh, absolutely. There because it, it's an interesting phenomenon there. Um, but yeah, practically, it, it's a one party decision, the new constitution and the electoral law. So take it as you will. Yeah. Well, let's let's go straight into to what you've just mentioned there, which was the announcement that came last week that Orban and Fidesz will be leaving the, the EPP, the European People's Party group in the European Parliament, the largest group in, in the European Parliament. So my understanding is that that was a I'm going to leave before I get fired move that he was already on the way out. But what's happened that's brought us to that point where Orban felt or perhaps was even told that he was about to be kicked out of the EPP? What's changed in the last few months? Mm, well, if you allow me, I would go back even a bit further. Please. Um, so. Fidesz had a long run from Orban himself being a vice chair of the European People's Party, I think ending in 2012, mm -hmm. um, to becoming at odds with them, or I would even say that being seemingly at odds with them. So in 2019, uh, in the European parliamentary elections, Fidesz has been campaigning in Hungary with billboards that were directly attacking Jean-Claude Juncker, so the then president of the European Commission, plus Manfred Weber, mm -hmm. um, who was the European People's Party Spitzenkandidat um, for becoming the president of the European Commission. And this caused tensions within the European People's Party, understandably, because Juncker was a commissioner, uh, commission president who was coming from the European People's Party. Um, and Manfred Weber, of course, was back then already uh, the leading, the chair of the parliamentary group of the European People's Party in the European Parliament. So then in 2019, the party itself brought forward the idea that Fidesz should be kicked out of the party family because it is not keeping the line. Mm -hmm. Then Orban raised the idea that he believes that the EPP should take a different path because it has become too much aligned with, with liberal and leftist ideas. And it should go back to the path of its founder, Wilfred Martens, um, whose idea was bringing together the Christian Democrats and the right or the conservatives uh, in Europe to create this gigantic uh, group. And already then it was shown how much willingness there is actually in the EPP to to move forward with, with kicking out Fidesz because a compromise was reached, um, which was a bit of a ambiguous decision that Fidesz itself asked the European People's Party to be suspended. And then even Fidesz's delegates voted for this uh, at, the, uh, at the political decision-making body of the EPP. And then Donald Tusk was elected president of the European People's Party, who is the former uh, prime minister of, uh, of Poland and whose own political position is at odds with Fidesz because nationally back home, his party is the main contender of law and justice, the governing uh, party in Poland. And Orban's uh, allies have been attacking Tusk for years now saying that he is instrumentalizing, instrumentalizing the European People's Party for his own domestic agenda, which is to say that he wants to differentiate the EPP from the conservatives because the conservatives are at, uh, in power at, back home and he wants to be seen as the main contender towards them. And it's also important to know that Fidesz had allies in this debate. 
So uh, Democratic Party of Slovenia, so the party of Janez Janša, uh, has been an avid supporter of Fidesz. And there are certain members of the European Parliament from Le Republica, uh, so the, the French uh, conservatives, and also from Partido Popular, so the, the Spanish conservatives who have been on the side of Orban. But the biggest supporter of him was the Christian Social Union of Bavaria. So Angela Merkel, CDU's, uh, well, sister party. And I think what changed was that his position in the party became untenable because he was constantly and openly attacking um, major figures within the European People's Party. The, the breaking point came when one of his MEPs attacked Manfred Weber, comparing him um, to well, Nazi officials in Germany. And I, I think that the viewers know how much of an insult it is in Germany to compare a politician to, to the Nazis. Um, so I would say, and this is my understanding, that these debates and these tensions were not actually based on policy and not actually based on ideology. They were more about certain personalities being attacked and certain personalities reaching the limit and deciding that uh, that now is the point to, to do something about it. And what was the, the castle's belly to say? Mm -hmm. Was that there was a proposal in the European People's Party group that would have allowed um, entire national delegations or entire party delegations from the group to be suspended altogether, whereas before they could only vote on individual MEPs. And of course, Fidesz understood this as preparing the ground for their suspension. Um, and they ran ahead and decided to leave before um, the European People's Party group in the parliament brings this decision. Now, what makes this also a bit ridiculous is that they do remain members of the European People's Party, so the party family on the European level, mm -hmm. and that the Christian Democrats, so the governing coalition partner of Fidesz, they have one MEP and he remains in the group. Uh, he, does, he did say to the media that he has no intention of leaving the group. And the Christian Democrats in Hungary are still full members of the European People's Party. So with voting rights, they had the right to delegate members to certain positions, to stand candidates in elections. So even though they are out with one feet, it's important to see that they are in with the other feet, mm -hmm. which, which I think also shows that it is, it is more about power and more about being able to still cooperate and still control um, each other's voting behavior than it is about actual values. So I think this entire quitting the European People's Party group is more a media stunt to calm down journalists, to calm down people in the Brussels bubble who follow these debates, that Fidesz is now separated from them. But I think what would really show whether this is a real break is if Fidesz MEP's voting behavior changes or whether they will still vote with the European People's Party uh, delegation. Yeah, it's, it's, you've, you've touched on the, the important factor of that whole story, which is, yeah, at the end of the day, they've still got the votes, you know? This, I think, from, from my understanding of the story, this is what has kept Orban having a relatively stable relationship with Merkel. She could rely on him to provide the votes for the EPP when it was time to propose policy. Do you think Merkel's decision to stand down this year has played a role in this whole development? I do not think so because it is seen that Armin Laschet, so Merkel's uh, successor, mm -hmm. will follow in, in the path of Merkel. But what was very visible though, is that the biggest supporter of, of Fidesz within the family was actually not uh, the Christian Democratic Union, but rather the Christian Social Union, so the Bavaria version of the CDU. Um, and there, there was a change. The president uh, who was elected recently, Markus Söder, 
very publicly voiced his dissatisfaction with, with Fidesz. And when he was elected, he also toured the Eastern European states, which uh, usually CDU leaders do to make sure that they have good relationships with these countries. And he skipped Hungary in this tour. Uh, he first went to Croatia to meet with uh, HDZ, so the local EPP party. Um, but, but he very publicly and very visibly did not visit Hungary. Now, this is the political level. When it comes to the economic level, I would not be so um, sure that, that these ties are, are broken. Because when all the discussions about TPP membership were going on, the Hungarian foreign minister went to Munich, um, and then he had a press conference together with one of the ministers, and then he announced um, investments in Hungary uh, in Mercedes. So, and, and these economic ties, the, the economic ties between the German car manufacturing industry um, and the Hungarian economy are, are very deeply rooted. So Hungary has the lowest um, corporate tax rate in the EU mm -hmm. of all the countries. Plus they give benefits to certain um, countries practically based on the name of the government. So if the government sees them as a strategic partner, um, then they are exempt from certain taxes. This coupled with the fact that Hungary does not have the euro, so the wages of the workers are paid in foreigns, which is inflating constantly towards the euro, means that the wages of these people do not have to be too high when you calculate it in euros. So practically, Hungary's competitiveness is based on cheap labor mm -hmm. uh, and based on the fact that companies do not have to pay high taxes in the country. And this is very beneficial, not only for German companies, but also from other uh, multinational companies. And I think this keeps the status quo or the balance um, with Orban very much intact because he knows that if he wants to give blows to, to European leaders, he can change the economic terms in which they play. But he has not done that so far. Perfect. Okay. It's really, it's really interesting to yeah, to dig into the, the layers to these these uh, alliances, if you will, or these um, these groups within the the European political system. So, sticking with alliances, we're going to have to talk about this game that uh, they appear to be playing between Hungary and Poland in at the European level. Something comes along that links money to the rule of law, and they both veto, and we're stuck in this endless loop. Now we know there's no, there's virtually no mechanism that the EU can use to force a change here. What can we, what can be done about this? This it appears to be a deadlock from what I've seen. Um, is this this action, repeated action by by Hungary and Poland together, is it seen? Is it uh, understood as transparent in Hungary, or is the feeling that well? our prime minister is fighting for Hungarian interests as opposed to European interests? Well, I would say again, that depends on who you ask in Hungary. Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely the narrative of the governing parties is that, that they are fighting for, for the interests of Hungary. And it, it's very interesting to say after each very important European Council meeting that everybody goes home and sells the deal as their victory. The Dutch Prime Minister goes home and say, we have uh, managed to secure um, a deal on the rule of law and tying the funding to rule of law. Um, Orban and Kaczynski, uh, sorry, not Kaczynski, but uh, Mateusz Morawiecki went home and said that we have secured more funding to our countries in the next seven year budget than we had before. So Looking beyond headlines, I think this whole debate was about um, putting negotiation tech, uh, tokens on the table and making sure that they can secure more funding for the countries than before. This was the whole um, veto issue, or this, this is what the whole veto issue was about in, in my understanding. Um, when it comes to the, the strategic alliance of, of Poland and Hungary, it's, it's important to see that Poland is, is a major European country. 
um, even though it does not have the, the voting power, the economic power of, of those of Germany or, or Spain or France. Um, I think it is the fifth uh, most populous uh, country in the EU. So for smaller member states, it makes sense to align themselves with a larger power in order to get their interest through uh, the European Council. And I think that is not something that's, you know, um, devious itself. Um, that is how the European institutional system works. And if you want to um, get your will through, you need to have alliances. And that is a very, I think, widely understood concept. The problem here is that how it was understood is that these countries want to secure the funding for, for themselves because that is how they can buff up their own, and I will use the words of Orban himself, national bourgeoisie in these countries. So what their narrative has been, at least in Hungary for the last 10 years, is that after the fall of communism, most of the companies were brought and invested in by foreign investors. So by German companies or American capital. And what this whole revolution and paradigm change meant for them and what they communicated about it is that we need to renationalize these institutions. So we need to renationalize um, the Hungarian oil company. We need to renationalize those banks that were privatized uh, to foreign investors in the beginning of the 1990s. And we need to create a national bourgeoisie, so a national capitalist class. And again, these are the Marxist terms that Orban Viktor himself were using. Mm -hmm. um, and they have done so. And that contributed to how the media landscape has changed, that contributed to how um, certain ownership of, of strategic companies has changed. And this whole system functions because of EU funding. And if that funding was not secured, um, then there would be major disturbances both in the economy and both with this kind of crony system that they have built up. So this is why it's strategically important for them to, to secure this funding. And this is why an alliance with Poland is, is strategically important for them. Perfect. Yeah, I think you're right. And it, it is important to note as well that creating alliances to promote your interests and your policies, that's not a bad thing per se. But I'm vehemently against a lot of the decisions that Hungary and Poland are taking in this, in this alliance. Um, we've, we've almost come to the end of, of everything I want to discuss. I'd like to finish up a bit on media freedom because there have been a lot of a lot of disappointing stories about Hungary coming out over the last year, but I think maybe the most heartbreaking was the one just, was it last month, when the last independent radio station was forced to go online only. How, how is this decision and the, the restriction of media freedom affecting things in Hungary at the moment? Well, I would uh, circle back there to what I said in the beginning about uneven playing fields when it comes to elections. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what is one of the one of the major advantages that the governing parties have in, in com competing with the opposition is that there is a large chunk of the media, especially printed and television media, which I would highlight is, is very important in uh, Eastern European countries because people still get their news from local newspapers and not from the internet. And those local newspapers are without uh, an exception are in the hands of a person who is very close to the government. Um, so this gives them a strategic advantage because of course all of these newspapers and all of the media that are in their circles um, well, they attack the opposition and they buff up the narratives of the governing parties. But I think here uh, to see how, how the media landscape changed, again, we have to talk about funding. Mm -hmm. So I think what, what happened is that journalism itself has changed a lot over the last 10 years. 
a lot of content moved online and with the introduction of social media, a lot of the funding also went away from, from mediums and were transferred to the social media platforms. What this meant is that mediums needed to reconsider their funding scheme. And most of the funding, of course, comes from advertising money. Now, the biggest advertiser in Hungary is the state, by far. So this means that by instrument instrumentalizing the state itself, the government can decide which media it keeps alive by giving them public funds and which media it dries out financially. This is one of the aspects. The other aspect is what I already talked about is this creating the so-called national bourgeoisie class. So by giving public tenders, often with EU subsidies to people close to the government or companies close to the government, they have created um, financial oligarchs who have the necessary capital to purchase mediums. So you have mediums which are dried out of funding because advertising is redirected from them towards other mediums. And then you have people with enough purchasing power to buy these mediums. And this has changed the landscape a lot because these people who have been buffed up with state money purchased those uh, companies that were tried up because no advertising money was flowing into them. Um, and there usually the agreement again goes or, or the argument usually goes that, well, this is simply a business endeavor. We simply purchased these companies because they were not competitive. They were not producing enough profits and we have turned them into profitable organizations. So it was a good business decision. But then when you look at what kind of news these mediums produce after the purchase, those are not news, those are clickbaity um, headlines of populistic language which create a lot of engagement on social media because people will click on, oh no, what migrants did again, or oh no, what this opposition politician did again. But that is not newsworthy, but it, it generates revenues because of the advertisement money. Mm -hmm. And this system was imported recently to Slovenia. So I think it's also important to know that it's not only a Hungarian problem. Similar things are happening at the moment in the Czech Republic. Um, similar things have happened recently in Poland by the state-owned oil company purchasing most of the local media, most of the rural print media in Poland. Um, and similar things are happening in Slovenia with Hungarian investors. And one could say, I would not argue this, but one could say that the economic argument is solid. The profits of these companies did rise, but the content, the quality of the content, the news that they provide are, are not news anymore. They are just, they're just propaganda, which creates a lot of engagement because of their enraging headlines, mm -hmm. but that generates revenues. Yeah, I mean, it's this, it is an interesting point because the, the revenues are there. Um, I mean, even putting aside the fact that the, the headlines are clickbaity and the stories are loaded with nationalist rhetoric, the idea of a monopoly on any media in any country, it's just so far removed from the, the core values that I think most EU member states leaders and population share. But it's just a really... I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to articulate the, the disappointment that you that I feel and that I'm sure others feel when you hear about this, these kind of stories, because it is also important to note it's not just Hungary. There are several countries in Europe and in the EU where similar things are happening, media being restricted. And it's a massive, massive issue, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think that is also important. I mean, not to diminish the importance of what is happening in Hungary, because even though I really dislike uh, those narratives that inflate the role of Hungary in all this like populistic far right uh, surge, mm -hmm. um, it, it definitely is a laboratory for, for some of these um, schemes of how they can operate. 
just to give you an example, um, probably that, that also got a lot of media attention that there was this law which forced uh, civil society organizations, NGOs that receive funding from, from foreign donors to label themselves as foreign agents if they received a certain amount of funding from, from a foreign donor. Which also meant, by the way, that the Hungarian Red Cross had to label itself as a foreign funded agent because most of their funding came from foreign sources. And this law um, was adopted in Russia and this law was adopted in Israel with very similar wording. Mm -hmm. um, so you could even argue that, you know, there is a uh, control C, control V uh, type of, of copying of certain schemes that work in these, in these countries, um, which, is, which is worrying. Um, and I also just wanted to know that um, I, I recently read a study that said that since 2006, globally, more countries were transitioning from democracy towards some sort of authoritarian regime, then there were countries that transitioned from an authoritarian regime towards democracy, which is of, of course worrying um, and concerning. And I'm just trying to say that this is not only a case with Hungary. I think it just became the most mediatized uh, example of, of what is happening there. And regarding what can be, what can be done about this or what can be uh, counterbalance to this. Um, yeah, I, I do agree with you that it, it, it seems quite sad and quite uh, depressing that the EU lacks the tools um, to, to deal with this issue. This recent text that you mentioned about the rule of law criteria or, or, or kind of tying funding to European member states um, to rule of law the devil is in the details there as well, because what it says is that funding can be suspended from member states if spending in these countries violate the financial interest of the EU, which means that it more tackles cases where EU funding is supposed to go to building a, a tourist location somewhere in rural Hungary and itself it ends up in the pockets of the local MPs daughter or sister <laughs> um, than when it comes to sanctioning countries where judicial uh, procedures are not respected or when it comes to um, issues where you know different citizens are measured with different um, legal uh, requirements. So just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, recently the adoption laws in Hungary were changed. Um, and the current law says that single parents can only adopt with the personal recommendation of the minister responsible for this area. So if a single parent wants to adopt, they have to write a letter to the minister and the minister has to approve the adoption. Unless you're married, if you're married as a married couple, you go through the necessary procedures. However, same-sex marriage is not legal in Hungary which means that the only loophole that was possible for uh, same-sex couples to adopt was to adopt as a single parent. But the minister can arbitrarily decide not to grant you the right to adopt. So I would argue that this is treating citizens with different um, measures simply based on their sexual orientation, mm -hmm. which is of course against fundamental rights in the EU. However, it, it just lacks the necessary um, tools to, to combat such a, such a discrimination. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an appropriate but a, a sad place to leave it because that is the point we want to, to reinforce is that the EU can be a tool for good for some, really, some real positive changes across all the member states. But it needs to get its act together a bit. It needs to stop focusing on the the economic side of everything all the time and it needs to see that the people of Hungary for example amongst other member states their rights are being taken away from them seemingly endlessly so yeah I mean um, Shimon thanks a million for explaining all of that I, I have a much clearer picture of what's going on in Hungary I'm sure our listeners do too what was the name of that book you recommended again just so we can put that out there 
Yeah, so it's called uh, The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, Authoritarian Capitalism, and the Accumulative State in Hungary by Gabor Schering. Uh, I can also send you the, the name of the book later. And um, I mean, I'm really happy to be here, Dermot. Um, I'm not sure if I could give a very positive outlook on, on, on how things are, are going in Hungary. However, I do want to maybe end on, on a positive note, mm -hmm. um, which is that there are elections coming up in 2022. And it is a bittersweet thing to say because most of the issues that are happening in Hungary now are related to the coronavirus crisis. But there seem to be a tension in the society against the government's actions. So restaurant workers and, and people working in hospitality threatened the government practically that they will reopen um, their, their restaurants and their, and their hospitality services um, if the government does not ease lockdown measures. So there is a certain tension rising there. Then with the 1st of March, 5% of the medical workers in Hungary left the, the profession um, because of a change um, in their employment status, which means that in the middle of a pandemic and, and at the height of the third wave that Hungary is, is experiencing at the moment, 5,000 people are out of the healthcare service. So there are very dire things happening, which of course nobody should be happy about. But there is the silver lining of all of this, which means that if the, if the opposition can get its act together and the six parties can manage to, to show a formidable foe to the government, there is a possibility that, that the system will not be changed from, from above. And I think that also is like many people have this idea of waiting for a messiah from the EU to come. And I think that is a very misplaced hope, I would say. I think that the best chance that all of these countries have for change, it has to come from to a grassroots level. Um, and there is a chance, a real chance, I think, uh, for that to happen next year in April. So I would, I would leave it on that. Fantastic. I certainly hope you're right. And um, we'll, we'll absolutely be keeping an eye on the, on the way the story progresses and how things, things move in Hungary and over the coming months. Shimon, Gergely, Chassar, thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Take care.